In today's video, I'll be getting a Thunder Laser Nova 63 out of its massive crate, in through a standard 32-inch doorway, and into a tight workshop. We'll set everything up and test it in today's guided tour down the rabbit hole. We recently had a sweet upgrade to our makerspace, the addition of a Thunder Laser Nova 63 130-watt CO2 laser. It's not a small laser, and we're working in a relatively small space. Since a lot of people out there are trying to decide on what laser to purchase, what gives them the most capability, and what they can fit into their space, I wanted to make this video to share the initial experience that we had receiving it and getting it all set up. As you can see, this crate is massive. It's big enough that the four foot long bobcat forks didn't reach all the way underneath of the crate to the other side. Also, with the forks adjusted in their widest position, there was still kind of relatively close together for a crate of this size and weight. So an important tip is to gently lift the crate an inch or so to see if it wants to kind of lean to one side or the other. And we did find that it wanted to tilt enough to one side that I asked our bobcat driver to back out and come back in an inch or two over to the side and try again. And the second time it felt a lot more stable. Our driver gently lifted it up, pulled back, and placed it on the ground. And now with it on the ground, the truck could pull away and the Bobcat driver could come around from the opposite side and have a straight drive down to the flat location where I wanted to uncrate it. Now when the crate was first being lifted out of the truck, I noticed that the forks were pushing up into the bottom of the crate. So I didn't want to lift it again without additional support. And I slid some 2x4s along the forks to spread the load along the bottom of the crate and just basically extended the length of the forks a little bit. And that let us uh, safely move it down to the spot that I planted to uncrate it. In hindsight, now it would have been a good idea to use 2x4s in this same way, unloading it from the truck as well. We just didn't realize that it was going to be an issue. In a view of it from later in the day, I could see exactly what the forks did when they first pushed up into the crate when we lifted it out of the truck. Um, there wasn't any problem as a result of doing this, but depending on how it's packed, you could potentially have some accessories that are in the area right where it pushed up and it could cause some damage. So just be aware of this. In any case, now I had the crate on the ground in a flat spot near the door I planned to use. I started the process of opening the crate, and as you can see, Thunder Laser does a pretty good job of packaging these lasers for a journey halfway around the world. Inside of the well-built plywood crate, the laser is wrapped in plastic, and then the corners are padded with some thick foam. There are zip ties and tape holding things in place in key locations that you'll also need to remove. You'd think it was a given that a laser like this would be carefully wrapped and secured for international shipping, but I've heard so many horror stories from people buying cheap lasers online or from other vendors or from eBay, so it's worth mentioning that both uh, this laser and the previous Thunder laser that I bought uh, were just extremely well packaged and uh, you know had zero problems uh, having them shipped halfway around the world, and uh, they came out of the box looking just perfect. Next, I began to strip off anything that was easily removable to get the weight down from the 1,300 pounds to something I could more easily manage. I started with the front pass-through panel and the lower front panel. For most of these doors, I just needed to use the supplied keys to unlock the door and pull a spring tension pin to allow me to just lift the door away. A few of the panels were also secured with some small hex head bolts that I removed using the hex wrenches that were supplied in the toolbox. For the doors with integrated fans, I needed to unplug the fans and unbolt the grounding cables before I could lift those panels away. All the electrical connections used quick disconnects, so the process is easily reversible when the time comes to reassemble. You'll want to be really careful when taking this door panel off the upper rear compartment where the laser tube is. The tube is glass and it can be easily broken. In my case, I decided to leave this door in place and it helped just to protect the tube as I was rolling it through the building. Next, I removed the honeycomb tray, the extruded aluminum knife edge supports, 
and finally the large sliding catch trays. Since they looked identical, I labeled them with a sharpie as left and right. I don't know if this was necessary, but just in case the drawer slides had been adjusted for a particular tray, I didn't want to accidentally swap them and then find that there were some binding issues later. Next, I removed the heavy lid assembly. In hindsight, I think this was overkill, uh, but I didn't have a way to track how much weight remained, and the last thing I wanted was to wish that I had removed it partway through trying to push it up the ramp and get it through the building. I could just barely reach the center hinge from the side, but I could reach it, and after removing the gas struts and removing the hinges, I was able to lift the door off without any assistance. The door is probably about 50 pounds or so between the steel and the glass. And the last part to remove was the 100 pound base that the whole laser sits on. There's hex bolts around the perimeter that you can get easy access to once all these doors are removed. I had a furniture dolly that was rated for maybe 500 pounds or so. Uh, one of these furniture dollies wouldn't be strong enough to support their remaining weight. I could have bought a second one and lashed them together on the back of the laser, but I was concerned that as I went up the ramp, there might be a moment where the shifting weight would overload one of the dollies and it could break. And then that would be the worst time to have it sort of uh, in midway through the building and have a wheel break or something like that. For not much more than the price of uh, two of these small furniture dollies, I bought uh, four 800 pound rated wheels, swivel wheels, uh, and I built a... Um, a dolly that fit exactly around the frame's dimensions. And by fitting it snugly into the recesses of the back of the laser, it wouldn't be able to shift around and it would have a much wider, more stable base while it was being pushed around. I just needed to lash it to keep it from falling away from the laser before it was sitting up with the weight of the laser resting on it. This dolly was built out of two by fours and some scraps of plywood that I had where the wheels would be mounted. I used three eighths inch lag bolts for the wheels and uh, I felt pretty confident that this dolly could really take anything that I was gonna throw at it. The next challenge was to get the laser tipped up onto its wheels. And this was kind of the sketchiest part of the process so far, mainly because I didn't really know how the weight distribution would feel until I was actually at that tipping point. After experimenting and seeing that I was able to gently slide the laser on the base, I tied some strong rope from the overhanging side of the laser back underneath to a reinforced anchor point on the pallet. My fear was that if I tipped the laser up while it was on an angle, the wheels would let it uh, kind of shoot out and the whole thing would come crashing down. So by estimating a little bit of slack in the line, the laser would be able to slide out to that tipping point and not go any further. And then it would kind of be forced to rotate up onto its wheels without having the ability to kind of kick out uncontrollably. Of course, I had the camera turned off when I had a passing friend help me tip it up at this point. Uh, but I will mention that it was pretty easy to tip it up onto the wheels. And with the help of two other colleagues, we rolled the laser up into the building without any strain. I should mention a few days in advance, I did make a ramp to soften the angle leading into this outermost door. Having rolled some large equipment into the building into the past, I knew that it would be a bad idea to try to use what was already there. So I was happy to see this ramp uh, dolly combo worked out really well. Have you seen the beauty is here? Yes. The baby has arrived. Soon after, I had a couple of students join me to help guide it the rest of the way through the lower level and into its final destination in our maker space. All right. Once we got it into the final room, we used some milk crates uh, and some spacers to get the base back up aligned with the laser so we could uh, put these hex bolts in that we had previously removed. Then we worked out the final plan to get the laser back up onto its feet. I built an A-frame out of some 2x4s with the idea that it would let us have a nice gradual controlled descent. This is a tight space though, and we needed to make sure that there was room to tip it down without it sort of leaning forward and hitting into the cabinets. Another concern was obviously that the laser would come down and the wheels would suddenly allow it to sort of kick back into the wall uh, and have it lose control during the descent. To prevent that, we took some more wood scraps and made legs that would extend back to the uh, wood trim baseboard that ran along the wall behind it, and then perpendicular piece of 2x4 that lined up just behind the wheels, so that way as it tilted down, they wouldn't be able to slide toward the wall, it couldn't kick out. Uh, it basically allowed us just to pivot in place. 
As an added precaution, I took the backs off of two office chairs that had pneumatic pistons, so that way they could act as shock absorbers if the laser was to drop on and suddenly. We had no intention of needing to use them, but we figured it was just some added insurance. To get the laser to tip up onto the A-frame's four-part block and tackle, one of my students used a floor jack and gently slowly lifted the back side of the dolly. And then once the laser rested on the A-frame, he was able to pull the jack out and the students moved uh, clear from the sides so they could just sort of be ready to help guide it from the sides, but they were out of the path should it somehow come down suddenly. And so with a little adjusting and easing it on the block and tackle, uh, it, it came down to its flat position again. And at this point, the hardest part was over. So shout out to Sayed and Prince for all their help there. It was definitely invaluable. Then it was a matter of removing the dolly in the A-frame and putting back all the parts that I had previously removed. So the trays slid back into place, the aluminum knife edge supports, the honeycomb bed, the front panels, the side panels, including reattaching those grounding wires, and then the lid and the gas struts. Next, I pulled the exhaust fan out of its packaging and I began to set up the ducting for that. I previously had a rigid duct set up for the old laser that ran out through the side of the building, so I plan to reuse that portion of the ductwork after cleaning it out a bit. I attached the flexible 6-inch ducting to the back of the laser and then to the inlet of the fan. And then the exhaust side of the fan ran to the 90-degree elbow that was already in place leading outside from the building. There's a dedicated power port on the back where the exhaust fan plugs into. Next, I unbox the included air compressor. There's a little bit of custom tubing that's included that fits over the air pump's outlet on the one side, and then it uses a quick connect fitting into the laser itself. In the included toolkit, I removed the silicon tubing for the chiller as well as the specialized AC power cable for the laser itself. The laser is designed to supply the AC power to all of these supply peripherals uh, from the ports on the back of the case and this single cable gets plugged into a 20 amp 110 volt outlet. The actual plug requires a 20 amp outlet, which you can identify by this sideways slot instead of a typical 15 amp outlet that has just the two parallel slots along with the grounding plug. Next, I unwrap the CW5200 water chiller, which is used to circulate water through the laser tube to keep it cool. I filled the chiller with distilled water that I bought from the local supermarket. It'll take about two gallons of water, as I recall. You can see the water level on the back of the chiller as you fill it, but after you run the laser and the pump pushes it through the laser tube, you'll want to double check here again because once the water is pumped into the laser itself, there'll be some more room in the chiller where you can top it off. Hooking up the chiller to the laser is pretty straightforward. The water outlet from the laser connects to the chiller's inlet, and the chiller's outlet loops back to the water inlet on the back of the laser. There's a short three pin cable with a smaller fitting that connects onto the back of the laser and a larger three pin fitting that connects to the back of the chiller. And this cable is used by the laser to just confirm that the chiller is working so that it can't run without the coolant flowing. The power cable then connects between the back of the laser and the back of the chiller. I used a short extension cable that I already had to let me put the chiller in a preferable spot. Then I connected the laser via a USB cable to the host computer I'll be using, which is an older iMac running Windows 10. I installed the default RDWork software, as well as the included license for Lightburn, which I'm not that familiar with yet. To do my first test etch and cut, I fired up RDWorks and imported an Adobe Illustrator file of a small star-shaped path. I wanted to use RDWorks here just because I'm more familiar with that, and I've been using that on my Nova 35 laser in my home shop. I wanted to just confirm that everything was up and working properly before I started to uh, mess around using Lightburn. And it's no surprise, the laser works great. In addition to learning to use Lightburn going forward, I have a few plans for customizing my Nova 63 setup, which I'll share in later videos. Be sure to subscribe if you want to be sure to see how I modify the exhaust, the air assist, Relocate the chiller, add a thunder cam, and add more of the optional items from Thunder Laser, such as the HD lens, the 4-inch long lens, and the rotary attachment. I hope this video helps show how manageable the Thunder Laser Nova 63 can be to bring into a tight space with a little planning. I should mention that Thunder Laser did have some good documentation that I consulted before making my decisions, so I didn't have to figure all this out on my own. 
In any case, I'm really excited to have my hands on this Thunder Laser Nova 63 with a massive 63 by 39 inch working area, a powerful 130 watt CO2 laser tube. So stay tuned for lots more details about the feature set of this laser and lots of projects that this beast of a laser allows us to tackle. Thanks for watching.